Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I am your host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line, but only temporarily, as I am filling in for your regular host, Mike Gorecki, who will be on paternity leave for the next three months. Congratulations, Mike. In the meantime, I'll be hosting the in-depth and informative conversations that you tune in to hear. This week, I'll be speaking with journalist and Manga Bay contributor, Erica Guise. Erica Guise is the author of Water Always Wins, Thriving in an Age of Drought and Deluge, from the University of Chicago Press 2022. She's also a National Geographic explorer and an independent journalist who covers science and the environment from Victoria, British Columbia, and San Francisco, California. Her work appears in the New York Times, Scientific American, Nature, NCIA, The Economist, Biographic, National Geographic, and also Manga Bay. I spoke with Erica about her book and what she calls Slow Water Solutions, which necessitate a shift in mindset and approach to humanity's relationship and usage of water and our water systems. Her book dives into the confluence of climate change and our water crises, how humans' us-first approach has ironically made it more difficult for us to get the water we need, is causing us to lose more of it, and contributing to global biodiversity loss. Erica has traveled to and worked in an incredibly diverse array of locations, cities, and landscapes, and has seen firsthand the challenges we face and how our aging water infrastructure is exacerbating them, and what slow water solutions, water detectives, and traditional hydrologists say we can do to work with water rather than against it. Erica, welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So what does it mean to say water always wins, especially in the context of today, and why is this so important when we think about how we interact with water? Water always wins is a fundamental truth. Sooner or later, water does always win. And, I mean, you see that when you look at the Grand Canyon and the persistence of water and how it carved that canyon over millions of years through rock. But we are seeing increasing flooding and drought and increasingly severe flooding and drought around the world. And that's for two reasons. One is because of climate change, which is uh, absorbing more water into the atmosphere. And so that both pulls water out of plants and soil and dry areas and then releases more of it at once in these heavy rainstorms. And, you know, for the last 150 years or so in Western development, we've had this fantasy that we can control water. And, um, you know, it's worked to a degree with our dams and levees and drainage systems in cities, but it's failing more and more often, both because of climate change and because of our development decisions, ironically. So that is urban sprawl, industrial agriculture, and even the concrete ways in which we're trying to control water. Um, So, You can think about this simply like with urban flooding, for example, the area of land covered uh, by pavement in our cities has doubled just since 1992. So, um, you know, that water has nowhere to go. Um, Before the pavement, it soaked into the ground and that reduced flooding. And it also um, allowed that water to be in the local system to supply streams and dry seasons. So when we pave over all of that land, we prevent that natural water cycle from happening. Um, Another thing we do is we build on wetlands. We have filled in 87% of the world's wetlands since 1700. And so it's not surprising, again, that we have a lot of flooding happening uh, in areas that were formerly wetlands because the water still wants to go where the water wants to go. Uh, And just because we've put a building there Uh, doesn't necessarily deter it. So in the book, you bring up the terms gray and green infrastructure. What are these terms? And can you talk about the distinction between the two? Sure. Yeah. Gray infrastructure is a a term used by engineers and urban planners. uh, And it, it means the things that we have engineered to try to control water. So that could be levees, dams, um, often with concrete, stormwater, drainage systems. Um, And green infrastructure uh, has a lot of different meanings, I guess. Um, And there are different names for it too, like natural infrastructure, or in the book, I'm calling it slow water. But basically it is trying to collaborate rather than control 
water, trying to collaborate with water um, to make space for it to function in its natural way to whatever degree possible. So that could mean restoring or conserving a wetland um, or floodplain. It could mean you know, bioswales in cities, which are vegetated dish- ditches that collect the water and move it underground. There are many aspects to it. Uh, and it can have sort of a, a greenwashing tinge in the wrong hands. But in my book, the way I'm talking about it is definitely uh, trying to accommodate or mimic natural systems to the greatest extent possible. In the book, you talk about a concept called slow water. Can you tell us more about what this is? Yeah, so in many of the ways in which our dominant culture has tried to control water, we have actually erased its slow phases. So that's uh, wetlands, floodplains, high altitude forests and grasslands that generate a lot of um, rain and rivers. Um, And so by eradicating these areas, by preventing water from... Uh, interacting with the land as it does in its slow phases, we've caused a lot of problems for ourselves. Um, That is, like I mentioned before, the ability of the land to absorb flood water, uh, the ability of the groundwater to supply streams and dry seasons. There are also many, many important biological and chemical cycling processes that happen in the slow phases where water interacts with land. Um, It's a critical part of the the base of the aquatic food web. Also really important for carbon storage. You know, these ecosystems can store much more carbon than forests, which is what we typically think of for for natural carbon storage. So all of the people I met around the world in my book are seeking, instead of to control water, as has been our kind of dominant way, our dominant approach, they're seeking to collaborate with water. Um, So that's a change in mindset uh, from seeing water as a commodity or a threat to seeing water as a friend or relative or um, an entity with which um, you have a reciprocal relationship where humans take care of water and water takes care of humans. And these latter ideas are very common in many cultures around the world, including many indigenous cultures. Um, So the kind of dominant way we've been thinking about water is not required. Um, There are many humans who have shown us a a different way to relate to water. So the the slow water practitioners in my book are all seeking to recreate the slow phases in some way and to facilitate that water-land interaction. You also point out in the book that corporations, at least in the United States, are recognized legally as persons, and by contrast, recognizing personhood of rivers and bodies of water would actually be one way to address the current environmental and social justice issues surrounding them. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, um, the rights of nature movement has been growing in Western culture uh, since the early 1970s, I believe. Um, when there was a law case that said, do trees have standing? In many indigenous law um, systems already recognize nature as an entity with its own rights. So this is a a matter of the dominant culture uh, kind of catching up to this way of thinking. And since the like early 2000s, In the United States, um, there was a group called Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund um, who started working with communities who did not want corporations to be spreading sewage sludge on their fields nearby, um, did not want fracking in their backyards, uh, did not want Walmarts putting mom and pop shops out of business. And so this legal group um, was working with them to kind of push the rights of nature as a way of giving communities power over states that were permitting these um, corporations to come and do things in their backyards. Um, And then globally, there has been um, in Bolivia and Ecuador, uh, 
rights of nature were enshrined into the constitutions. In 2010, Bolivia passed the Law of Rights of Mother Earth, and in 2012, the government passed a revision to that law. And in 2016, the Constitutional Court of Colombia recognized the Atrato River as an entity subject to rights of protection. And since then, there have been other opinions written by the Colombian Supreme Court in favor of recognizing the personhood of nature. And then since then, we've seen rights awarded to rivers, um, like one in New Zealand, one in Quebec. There are many indigenous groups who are trying to get um, rights enshrined for their bodies of water, like um, the Klamath River in Northern California. Um, I think there have been river rights uh, for the Ganges in India. Um, Some wetlands in Georgia and Florida (laughs) are trying to get rights as well. Basically, it's arguing that the river or the water body has a right to exist and it has a right to conduct its relationships with microbes, birds, plants, etc. Um, and it has a right to do all the things that, that a river naturally does. Um, because in dominant culture, we've really viewed water as a commodity in this way. And there have even you know, not been real consequences for pollution or removing all the water, et cetera. Um, It's often an environmental justice issue as well. Um, You know, I come from California um, where we have a lot of water engineering and much water comes from elsewhere. And so there's this really common idea that, oh, if you have water scarcity, um, let's just bring it in from somewhere else. But there was a really interesting um, 40-year analysis that showed that interventions on big rivers worldwide over this 40-year period brought water to 20% of the world's population, but decreased water availability to 24% of the world's population. So, you know, it's not magic water. (laughs) It's coming from somewhere. It's coming from some people as well as nature. So... The, the slow water practitioners, um, another aspect of slow water is ideally slow water is local water. Um, there are some uh, parallels to the slow food movement, and there are many benefits to living within um, local water means. Uh, so, You explain in the book that a lot of gray water infrastructure in cities is aging out due to the fact that much of it was built in the 1930s through the 1970s, and that we're actually losing up to 40% of our water in the cities. And the problem you just described sounds like it compounds the problem even more. So how do we respond to that? Yeah, the slow water practitioners are looking to open up a lot of our paved areas um, to find ways for the water to infiltrate into the ground. Uh, So that can take many forms. Um, One common way people do it is, you know, there was a lot of industry along rivers uh, 100 years ago, and it was often very polluting. And in some cases, then that technology sort of phased out. Uh, So then you had abandoned polluted areas And so people have been motivated to clean those up and to provide access to rivers. Um, But that's also a way in which you can say, okay, we're not going to build new buildings there. We're going to have it be a park. And, you know, when it's dry out, people can enjoy the park. And when the water comes, here's an area that that the water can um, reside and, and participate in its natural process. A really interesting story um, another podcaster told me. He had been living in Amsterdam, and they had, uh, right in front of his house, they had to replace a pipe. And instead of having pavement, concrete, for the sidewalk, they had pavers that sit together. So there was no jackhammer. You know, they came in and they levered up the, the pavers. They dug up the little section of pipe. They put it back, they put the pavers back. So it was a way in which um, you can, you have, you're giving the water a path to the underground when you have those permeable um, pavers for your, for your sidewalk. Um, but then you're also reducing all of the energy and carbon emissions and generating that concrete, um, all of the waste and breaking it up and taking it to the landfill and then having to create more. Um, So I think that is a really intriguing example 
of how we can have much easier access to the water infrastructure um, that we need uh, and also facilitate water's natural relationships um, to some degree. You mentioned the term water detectives to describe people in this book, such as the man who you were biking through Alamo Square with in San Francisco at the beginning, and he points out a puddle on the sidewalk, which is actually the remnants of natural springs below the park. So can you tell our audience what a water detective is and the kind of work they do and what they're looking for? Yeah, water detectives are kind of a, a broad term that I apply to, to many different kinds of people but they share a curiosity about water and a sense of respect for it as opposed to hubris and this idea of trying to control it. Um, So some of them are amateur ghost stream hunters, uh, like the person you mentioned. Um, So many, many of our cities, almost all of our cities, uh, were built near water bodies, and then at some point, uh, many of those were uh, buried in pipes uh, and then built over. So we don't really know where a lot of the water is moving through in our cities. And these people um, have gotten curious about that, and they are yeah, doing some detective work to try to find them. Um, and so people like that are using historical maps or observation, like noticing this puddle with this little ring of mossy scum uh, or plants that show, you know, uh, if a willow tree typically grows by a stream. So if you see willows, you know that there must be a fair bit of water uh, nearby. Um, But water detectives also include urban planners, landscape designers, engineers, ecologists, biologists, Basically, anyone who is working with water in some way and has that curiosity and is trying to understand water's relationship with the underground, with rocks, with microbes, with beavers, and with humans. And on that note, can we talk about the work of J. Sri Venkatasan in Chennai and also about the traditional knowledge of hydrology in the area and the plans Chennai has to revamp the way it manages its water? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Chennai made international Chennai India made international headlines a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, when it ran out of water. But in fact, Chennai runs out of water almost every summer, and it also floods with some regularity. And for local people, the more dramatic event was a, a flood in 2015 that killed at least 450 people and left many people stranded in their houses for up to a month. And what's kind of sad about Chennai is that it actually receives one and a half times the water it consumes in during its monsoon period. So there's no reason it should be running out of water. But like many cities around the world, the area covered by the city has quintupled uh, since 1980, uh, maybe maybe even more. Um, It's just sprawled like crazy. And It was a naturally very water-rich area, so there are three rivers there. There are backwaters and wetlands and brackish marshes. So to build the city, basically, they filled in a lot of that, um, which took away a lot of area from water. And then, you know, when the rains come, it floods. And also, when it's the dry season, they haven't retained that water locally. They've rushed it all out to sea. And so now there are trucks that are going around and pumping groundwater and trucking it to people, and they're looking at desalinization plants. Um, but it's kind of crazy because they get enough water that, that you know they need. They don't need to be bringing it from somewhere else if they would just capture the rain that falls. So Jay Sri Venkatasan is an amazing woman. She's a biologist uh, who 20 plus years ago founded a nonprofit called Care Earth Trust. And she's done really amazing work mapping the historical water bodies of the Chennai area and showing all the ones that have been lost to development over this massive boom period of urban, rampant urban building with very little planning. And she's been so successful in this work. And it's not just her. She has scientists um, underneath her who are are also doing this work. Um, But they have succeeded in both the, well, city, state, and national level at 
those governments recognizing um, the detriment that the destruction of these wetlands has created and um, mandating a halt to that and a restoration of some of those wetlands. She's also working to declare a really important wetland on the south part of the city called Palakaranai Marsh, a uh, Ramsar protected site. Um, and that marsh is so sad. Um, just in the last 20 years, they built a, an IT corridor there and a lot of new housing. And so 90% of the marsh has disappeared. And this was a major place where you know, birds would stop on their migrations uh, between Europe and places south. <laughs> um, anyway, it was a major, major flyway, major bird uh, stopover place. And there are still birds there and they're amazing, but they have 90% less habitat than they did a very short time ago. Um, so the other component of what's really fascinating about South India is And, you know, all across India, people developed really innovative ways to make the most of their local water, depending on their local climate, geology, um, culture, etc. And that's a big, important piece of slow water is that it's not like a dam where you're stamping out a kind of cookie cutter solution that's the same everywhere. Um, You really have to work with the local environment and figure out what's going to work best there and with the local culture. So in South India, the Tamil people who live in Tamil Nadu, which is the state where Chennai resides, um, they have at least a 2000 year tradition of uh, building something called the Eri system. And that's spelled E-R-I-S. And basically, um, there's a mountain range that runs north-south down the Indian uh, subcontinent. And so from the top of the mountain down east to the Bay of Bengal, which is where Chennai sits, they had dug this series of depressions. And so one pond, uh, you know, high up on the mountain, on the low side, it would have a little divot. Uh, So when that pond got full, it would run over to the next pond and so on down the mountain. Um, And these were not just irrigation ponds. These were uh, connected to local rivers and streams where they exist on the surface. So basically, the local people had inserted themselves into the natural hydrology. They were giving the river a way to slow itself on its route downhill to move more water underground to raise the water tables. So, you know, when they were pumping from wells or trying to grow their plants, they would know, you know, how much water was available in the soil. Um, And then in places where there aren't rivers and streams on the surface, uh, they would basically also support um, the groundwater system, which those are very, very wide area. Um, So they had a big, big impact on water availability. And um, when the British came, they estimated there were 53,000 of these ponds scattered across the South India. And um, it was just really an incredible system. Also, the local community was involved in maintaining these systems, which is another aspect of of slow water uh, is community engagement on whatever level, uh, you know, might be appropriate for a local area and culture. But in this case, um, People participated collectively in removing sediment that would accumulate. They would use that to fertilize their fields. And then they also had a water sharing agreement that was quite um, complex and ensured that uh, water was distributed equally. Um, There was also uh, each temple would have a a water tank as well. And so water was brought sort of into the heart of, of culture and religion the British respect had limits. Uh, when they came, they they said, wow, this is incredible. And then they proceeded to destroy it and introduce centralized water management. And after independence, um, Indian people uh, continued the, the British approach until now uh, when they are trying to restore some of those connections. So some of these tanks have been filled in. Um, some of the connections for water to flow between them have been obliterated by development. So there's a lot of work to do, but um, it's, uh, it's a culture that I think people there, um, if, if they know about it, which not everybody does, um, they have a lot of pride in it. So um, yeah, I'm hopeful that 
that work uh, tied to the wetlands restoration as well um, can help them really start to heal their hydrology. One interesting thing about how innate these ponds have become to the landscape is that the word eddy means tank in Tamil. And at this distance in time, no one remembers whether a particular water body is human or nature made. So the words tank, lake, and water body are basically synonymous because they don't remember whether it was built by humans or or nature. You interviewed A.R. Siders for this book, and you quoted her saying, fighting the ocean is a losing battle. Can you talk about what that means in the context of managed retreat in the continental United States, particularly in places like coastal Louisiana and Florida? Yeah, so... All of the people in my book, The Water Detectives, are uh, seeking to restore space for water in many ways. And they are trying to do that within existing human habitat um, to, uh, you know, so that we can live together with water. Um, But with the catastrophic climate change that we've set in motion, we are going to have to make significant changes in how we do everything according to the latest IPCC report, um, and especially water. And yeah, um, something like 40% of the world's population lives within 100 miles of coasts. So uh, with sea level rise accelerating, many of those properties, those people, those businesses are going to have to move. Um, It's just not possible to wall off the entire ocean. And there are good reasons not to do that as well. Uh, Aside from how expensive it is, um, fundamentally, it doesn't work very well. And if you can't wall the entire thing, um, you're just pushing that energy onto your neighbors who maybe don't have money for a seawall. So again, it's an environmental justice issue. Um, So A.R. Siders is uh, a well-known researcher into managed retreat. And basically she's advocating that we know this is coming. And if we plan ahead and we don't wait till there's a disaster when we're all scrambling and suffering, um, then, you know, we can move towards something better We can choose to create a more egalitarian society, a more sustainable society. And, you know, it can feel overwhelming if you think about even just like in the United States, we have so much coastal area and so many people living at risk in low places. Um, The Union of Concerned Scientists did a really interesting analysis a year or two ago, and they looked at like, well, how much would it cost to buy out all of these properties that are at risk. And in fact, they came up with a number that was just north of 1 trillion. So, you know, that is a ton of money. But if you look at the money that suddenly materialized in response to the coronavirus, it's not impossible for a really rich country like the U.S. to marshal that kind of money if they choose to do so. Of course, it's a matter of political will, and who gets that money and who's prioritized. So it's complicated, but certainly in wealthy countries, it's possible. Um, It's harder to imagine a country like Bangladesh, which also has so many people uh, at risk and already flooding. It's it's tough, but um, it's reality. This is the reality we've caused by ourselves, for ourselves by not um, reducing emissions. And the cool thing about what the slow water practitioners in my book are advocating is if we do move back, we can then turn over that land back to the natural coastal ecosystems that we have eradicated. And those ecosystems have really cool powers for (laughs) protecting us, whether we're talking about um, tidal marshes, mangrove forests, eelgrass beds, coral reefs, barrier islands. All of these ecosystems um, protect the coast from wave energy. And some of them, uh, like mangroves, have incredible carbon storage capacity, much more than tropical forests. And things like tidal marshes I write about uh, in San Francisco Bay, they actually have the power to grow with sea level rise, to grow vertically. 
uh, to protect us. But they need three things, which are t- time, space, and sediment. And sediment uh, is something that we have deprived coastal e- ecosystems of with our upstream dams. So, um, yeah, historically, a lot of that sediment would be carried down the rivers, but now we've blocked it. And there are many reasons why South Louisiana has been falling away over the last century, but a significant part of that is the way in which we've blocked the sediment that continues to rebuild that land. So that's that's a problem uh, worldwide and, and another downside of, of dams. So what about the water crisis in the southwestern United States, particularly the Colorado River? Can you talk about the challenges we face there? There's no doubt that the U.S. Southwest is experiencing intense drought that has been made more so by climate change. Um, But another significant piece of that problem is the way in which we have used water engineering and bringing water in from elsewhere to dramatically inflate the populations and the activities in these very dry places that don't have enough water on their own to sustain those populations or activities. And, you know, I'm thinking of like, you know, growing cotton in Arizona, which is a very water intensive product or, um, you know, growing alfalfa in, in Arizona with water from elsewhere that's then shipped to Saudi Arabia to feed their cattle. <laughs> Um, So, you know, there's a lot, a lot of area to conserve water, to make different choices. But um, there's a a field called sociohydrology, which basically looks at, in the past, hydrologists looked at water patterns and tried to predict, you know, how much flow a river would have based on variations, you know, among different years, etc., But for a long time, they didn't consider the human impact on water systems. So the field of sociohydrology is trying to change that and trying to acknowledge that, in fact, we are having a massive, massive impact on the water cycle. And the Southwest and and Southern California are very good examples of how uh, when you bring in water from elsewhere, you create this cycle of scarcity and boom. So it's very similar to the idea of, you know, you have too much traffic. So you expand the freeway, you put in a couple more lanes, and then people are like, oh, look, there's tons of room to drive. (laughs) And so more people start driving. And then you have gridlock again. So it's very much the same with with water supply from elsewhere. Um, Again and again, Uh, You bring in water and then that attracts more development, more people to settle there, uh, more businesses that have water intensive practices. And next thing you know, you know, you're scarce on water again. So we have made ourselves incredibly vulnerable to a a cycle that was known to feature scarcity um, by all of the ways in which we have brought in this water from elsewhere. And it's another example of an environmental injustice uh, when you think about the Colorado River uh, and how it has basically petered out uh, before reaching Mexico for decades now. And so, you know, farmers in Mexico don't have water because the U.S. has taken all the water. And, you know, there are some more recent agreements that are trying to address that and, and trying to address water for ecosystems. Um, but it's, it's too little and, and very late. I have to say, I really love this quote where you say, the longer we think about following water's lead and letting go of control, the more we may see creative ways of fitting land and people and water together. What are some of those creative ways that we could look to right now? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we can go back to the Southwest again. Um, I don't want to sound like, you know, all those people who have moved to the Southwest are, are now just out of luck. Although I think there well could be a migration toward more water-rich places as as time goes on. Um, but there, you know, we've been thinking of water as a commodity and we've been fighting over every molecule. And in California, there's the fish versus farmers argument. Um, but in fact, what the water detectives are showing is when you heal the hydrological cycle, uh, you 
can reap myriad co-benefits. So the same water can serve the environment and then serve people. Um, so in the Sacramento area, there have been some really interesting studies showing how when you allow water to linger on the floodplains like nature intended, that generates all the food growth um, and salmon who linger on the floodplains uh, rather than just going straight down the river are 12 times fatter. Um, so they're healthier, they're stronger, and they are better able to survive and they're less likely to need that dedicated uh, water flow. Not, not that you shouldn't have that. The, the environment definitely needs water flowing through the river. But that water can pause on the floodplains in the spring and then go back into the river, also making more water available uh, downstream later in the season because it's feeding the groundwater and supplying the stream in summer. You know, in the West, we tend to think of streams as seasonal. Um, of course, there are some that have always run just in wet seasons, but more streams than we think uh, actually did run year round because they were supplied with groundwater from the natural hydrology uh, moving up. Um, so the extent to which we can allow water to reclaim that natural slow phase, um, you know, we're also helping ourselves during the dry season. An another great example are beavers. Um, so beavers are being used in the United Kingdom to try to stop uh, flooding downstream, and then they're being used in the western U.S. as a hedge against drought. And it's because beavers build these ponds, which slow water on the land, and then the water is able to move underground and supply those systems uh, throughout a longer period of the year. Um, and interestingly, uh, beavers can also be little firefighters. Uh, it's not just that their ponds are fire breaks, but also that they're raising the water table uh, across a wider area, which makes water more available to plants. Um, so they're less desiccated and better able to withstand burning. Um, so it's really important to think about water systems and water's relationship with all of these entities from the underground plants, beavers, etc. Um, because when you have healthy systems and they're functioning as they should, many things are easier. Uh, you know, we've really pushed all of these systems to the brink in trying to maximize them for ourselves. But that kind of human supremacist attitude is really harming us um, because, uh, you know, the systems are brittle. When we encourage all these people to move into the Southwest where there isn't very much water, we make them vulnerable. So, you know, we have really exacerbated these problems with water with our development choices and our decisions. And if we think about water differently, if we think about water as a partner, um, as a collaborator, um, as an entity with its own relationships um, and deserving of, of space to pursue those relationships, the whole system is, is more resilient and flexible. And is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would like people to know? Um, I think uh, just an idea that I like to leave people with is, um, <clears throat> you know, climate change feels really overwhelming. Uh, we're waiting for international governments to reduce emissions. And we're waiting for, you know, mega corporations to change their practices. And it, it can feel really hopeless but the really cool thing about slow water projects is they are unique to their place. And so that means there's a real opportunity for people to get involved on a local level in, in whatever way, you know, whether it's, you know, through their work or going to city council meetings. Um, I think we have a real instinct toward great infrastructure because that's what we know. And so it's like, oh, there's a flood and, you know, we should build a levee or we need water, let's bring it in from somewhere else, let's build a desal plant. Um, but if people are aware of these other options and how working with water can really make life better and really better quality of life, you know, more nature right near us um, and that we can enjoy, you know, during recreational periods, etc. It's a way that we can make our communities more resilient to climate change and to water extremes and also 
start to mitigate climate change because there is a carbon storage element in so many of these projects. Um, they're also supporting biodiversity, and you know that's a whole that's a whole other area in which we have pushed the world to the brink and are now threatening ourselves as the the services that these ecosystems provide are breaking down. You know, from food, food pollinators to water cleaning, storage, etc. So slow water projects are a way for communities to get involved with their neighbors and to make themselves more resilient to climate change and also to help slow climate change. If you're interested to read Water Always Wins, I encourage you to do so. Visit slowwater.world where you can purchase a copy, and I will provide a link in the show notes. If you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. And another way to help us is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, so just a dollar per month will really help us offset the production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash manga bay to learn more and support the manga bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash manga bay. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the manga bay newscast nearly a half million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows in all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can also read all our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com forward slash mangabay or on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, where our handle is at mangabay on all three platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Mangame Newscast. I am your interim host, Mike DiGirolamo, filling in for your regular host, Mike Gorecki. I'll see you next time.